Let's begin with first species counterpoint. We'll start with the simplest situation, only two lines at a time to consider, both in whole notes. There is no rhythmic independence at all between them. Furthermore, there'll be no dissonances at all. The only thing which can distinguish the two lines at this point is their respective contours and ranges. We'll start with a given melody, called a cantus firmus, and attempt to add another line in a different voice which enriches the texture but has a different contour. We use a given cantus because it's not always easy to write a line which allows for many different solutions. An idiosyncratic line tends to allow for very few possible counterpoints, whereas these given canti are neutral, more flexible. Later on, the student will write both voices without using a cantus. Here's an example of first species counterpoint. I've listed the intervals between the voices. I've named the intervals all as if they were within one octave. Incidentally, first species does not allow for repeated notes. The cantus here is in the lower voice. You'll notice that we have only thirds, sixths, and fifths between the parts. While respecting the choral vocal ranges, this is a good countermelody to the cantus. The peaks of the two lines don't arrive at the same time. The cantus peaks in the third bar while the added melody peaks near the end, on the G. The harmonic result is rich and the cadence is convincing. Note that, although you must have the root of the tonic triad in the bass at the end, the top part can end on any note of the tonic triad. This is the way a good first species exercise should sound. Now a second example, with the same cantus, but now in the top voice. This one starts and ends with an octave, but otherwise uses the same intervals as our first example. Once again, the peaks are independent, the cadence is clear, and the result is harmonically rich. Seems easy, doesn't it? Well, now let's look at what can go wrong. First, an example with the same cantus. Here, the parallel empty fifths and octaves create holes in the context of harmony which should be rich, filled with thirds and sixths. Now an example with somewhat more subtle problems. Here in the third bar, both voices move up into a fifth, and the top voice has a leap. This has the effect of accenting the fifth. The problem is that a fifth is not very rich, and here it's a bare moment in an otherwise rich texture. The same thing happens in the bar before the end, with both voices moving in the same direction into an octave, again with the top voice leaping. As before, the result is disappointing, bare instead of rich. These are called, respectively, direct fifths and direct octaves, and they should be avoided in two parts. Now another example showing a common problem. The problem here is that starting at the arrow, the two voices are moving in parallel tenths. They are really no longer independent. Also, it's not a good idea to have the line peak on the leading tone, since it leaves the listener with the feeling that it's somehow incomplete. Now a last example with the new cantus. The 
problem here is that the cadence is not convincing. The cadence needs to create clear punctuation. Here, the F natural before the N contradicts the G minor tonality. Even in G melodic minor, the F should descend stepwise, and the direct fifth into the last chord doesn't help either. Now it's time for the students to do some exercises. There's a PDF document with several kanti available at the link below. The kanti should often be transposed since different keys place the voices in different parts of their respective ranges. Remember, respect the vocal ranges, only octaves, fifths, thirds, and sixths between the voices for now. Aim for overall harmonic richness. Not more than three bars of parallel movement at a time. Melodic peaks should not coincide. And sing and play.